Hello, guys. Uh, my name is Yi. I work, we all work on the same team, mobile platform architecture. Um, so before we jump into ribs, I sort of want to uh, talk about, uh, briefly go back to why we're doing this, right? Um, there's a couple interesting things I realized about Uber's application versus some of the other applications I've worked on. Um, Uber, is, Uber app is incredibly real time, right? When you're requesting a trip, we need to figure out what, uh, where all the drivers are. Do we have any drivers around you? Uh, what, the, what those drivers are doing? What is the current price, price based on a uh, surging factor? Uh, is there any raining? Is there any tr uh, trash tracks around you? And all that stuff. Um, at the same time, it is also incredibly stateful. We need to understand if you're on trip. We need to understand if you're requesting a trip. Uh, we need to understand, do you have a payment method? Are you in the process of adding a payment method? All those states sort of add up and compound together. Like Tony said, it makes the application incredibly hard to develop when we use a traditional architecture like MVC. So when we face a um, really giant problem like this, as engineers, we tend to try to break big problems down into smaller problems so we can solve them sort of independently and atomically. So one way we've been do, uh, we did that was using the scope stuff that Tony talked about. So we break down the application into different states, into different scopes. They each have invariants uh, that we can make assumption of. Uh, we can use the compiler to help us enforce that the invariants are indeed correct. And then the next thing we want to do is further break down the scopes, right? Each scope is still pretty large. If we think about like the logged in scope or the location editor scope or your on trip scope, those are pretty large things, right? How do we uh, prevent them becoming just one single big giant file that represents one scope? Um, that's generally what we would end up with if we used some of the more traditional architecture like uh, MVC, MVVM, Viper, and so on and so forth. So in order to do that, what we came up with is, is uh, ribs. Um, ribs are not, they're not just delicious. We, I think we all had some ribs. Um, but at the same time, it turned out they're really useful in breaking down things. The three letters actually do stand, do, they do have meanings. I think Thomas alluded to this very early on. R stands for router, I stands for interactor, B stands for builder. We'll go into details of what they actually mean. And there's some optional components to RIB as well. <laughs> nope, help. <laughs> Adam make it work? Yeah, sweet. Awesome. Swiping works. Um, okay. So as I, as I was saying before, uh, what we usually, when we usually uh, use a traditional architecture like MVVM, MVC, what we end up is this, right? We have massive view controller on LS. We have massive fragments on Android. Uh, we just lump everything, lump all the states, all the real-time real -time stuff into a single giant file that usually it's thousands of lines long with a lot of EFLs blocks, with a lot of state switch statements. Uh, we can't test it. Nobody understands what it does. We can't modify it because it will probably break somebody else's feature. So we don't want this. Let's go into ribs. And the core of a, a, a single rib is the interactor. This really is the brain of the application. This is the core of the rib. It contains all the business logic, it knows how to make service calls. It knows how to transition between states, what states to transition into. It keeps some small amount of state because of the breaking down of scope uh, to itself. It basically deals with business logic. Next, we have the router. The router, it's, uh, we can think of it as a uh, helper for the interactor. So when the interactor decides it wants to transition from one state to the next state, it doesn't necessarily need to provide the implementation, right? Then the file will just grow really large. So we break that out. We put that into the router. The router provides the implementation detail of how to route from one state to the next state, even though the interactor is the one that technically commands the router to do that. 
And then we have the builder. Uh, the builder is roughly a factory pattern that allows us to compose different parts of the rib together to form new ribs. Like imagine if we have two ribs, we can actually use a separate builder uh, to use the first ribs router and the second ribs interactor and put them together to create a third rib. It, it allows us to do unit testing. It allows us to compose uh, different components of the rib together. And of course, when we build an application, we can't just deal with uh, business logic. We can't just deal with state transition. We have to put pixels on the screen. We have to let the user interact with it. So we have the view controller, or it's a plain view on Android. So unlike traditional architecture, however, the view or the view controller here is really, really dumb. It only deals with layout. It only deals with the animation and nothing else. Pure view logic. And then finally, we have a, a optional, uh, or I should say optional, optional component called the presenter. Uh, this one is rarely used. Um, we want to put presentation logic in here. And what we mean by presentation logic is logic that translates business uh, models into view models. For instance, if the interactor, which handles business logic, receives a business model from a server response, but what if that business model is really complex and we don't want the view controller to start understanding the complexity of the business model in order to display it? We want to transform that business model into a view model. Where do we put that logic? Well, that's, where we put, uh, that's why we have the presenter. Now on the reverse side, when the view intercepts a UI event, a tap event, a scroll event, a drag event, uh, we may not want to directly pass that view event to the interactor and just start doing some business logic, right? We might want the presenter to translate or transform that logic in some way uh, and then tell the interactor to actually do something. So the, uh, the presenter sits in between the interactor and the presenter to do this translation and transformation logic. And the reason why it's optional is because most of the time, there isn't that much logic, to, there isn't that much code to actually do the transformation of business models. There isn't that much logic to do some business logic because of tab event is basically passed through. So then in that case, we just don't need a presenter. We just have the other four things and then we're all set. So these are the components of a rib. Each rib defines a scope that Tony mentioned, right? In, that, in the tree Tony showed us before, each one of those uh, little boxes is basically a rib. Some of them have views, others don't. But again, because the rib is rooted in the interactor, is rooted in business logic, we can then define our scopes based on business logic. So, now that we've broken down the application into scopes that are only responsible for a, uh, a small set of states, and we've, we've, we've broken down a single scope into further atomic components of a rib, let's put them all back up together so we can actually create a feature and create an application. So in this example, this is a, uh, well, this is a really simple example, but at the same time, this is actually a real example that we have in our writer app. And in fact, I imagine this example applies to almost all apps. Um, it's simple because uh, we've broken down the scope so much, but at the same time, it sort of illustrates how powerful this concept can be. Let's imagine we have a root scope. Uh, that's the root of the application. It's a root rib that lives as long as the entire application. Of course, at the beginning, uh, the user is logged out. So the root doesn't have to handle how to display the logged out view, how to deal with uh, taking user input of username password, how to make the network request of signing in. So we delegate that out to a separate rib called the logged out rib. So we attach the logged out rib once the application launches as sort of the default child of the uh, root rib. Next, when the user inputs some username, password info, taps a button, all the internal rib components work together and the interactor eventually makes a server call says please log me in here's the username here's the password that request goes to the server the server processes that here's the cool part root can actually directly listen for that stream transform root can listen for the session stream if you will when the session stream emits a valid session a valid token because of that login request logged out scope fired, 
root will then be able to automatically react to it and attach the logged in scope and detach the logged out scope. Now we're logged in. All the states that used to be kept in the logged out scope, like the username and password stuff, we can throw them all away. We can throw away the entire logged out rib, deallocate, freed up that memory, and then use that memory for something else. And all of this happened sort of magically in the sense that we're not keeping transient state in any way. Their root isn't saying, uh, isn't keeping any transient state. Uh, logged in is not even aware of there's a, such a state called logged out. Same as logged out isn't aware of there's a rib called logged in. This, this, uh, this sort of reactiveness of confining scopes into ribs really make things simple. So that's a sort of a really zoomed in picture of, uh, uh, of uh, three ribs in our application. Uh, Tony showed this picture before. This is, a, this is still a dramatically simplified picture of the writer app, but I wanted to point out something interesting here. The yellow ones are the uh, ribs that don't actually have a view. The green ones are the ones that actually do have a view. So I tried to draw some errors here without making the entire picture look crazy. But as you can see, the menu has a view. It's got that little hamburger button at the top. Location editor has a button. The little circle, uh, we call them shortcuts or accelerators are at the bottom. They of course have views. They draw pixels on the screen, but at the same time, they define their scope. They define their dependencies. They define the states that they hold so they can perform the business logic that need to perform. Now contrast with, this picture isn't totally clear on the projector, but contrast with something like logged out, request, or favorites and those things, they don't actually have any views to draw, right? Like request is a good example. It needs to deal with the business logic of actually sending the request, the collecting the information of your pickup location, where you want to go, what type of vehicles you, you've selected, and aggregate that all that together, send to the back end and actually make the pickup request but it really doesn't have anything to draw on the screen, right? Like everything else is drawn by other stuff already. We have the map, the location editor, and so on. So because this asymmetric nature of business scope, uh, sorry, the business portions of a rib and the view portions of a rib, we can actually design ribs for whatever purpose we're trying to do. Are we trying to encapsulate a portion of business logic? Then let's not build a rib with, let's build a rib without views. If our rib does indeed need to display server data or user interaction on the screen, then let's build a rib that has a view. It really gives us that, gives us that flexibility, which is what the traditional architectures don't really give us. So I wanna focus a little bit more on here just to contrast what the two trees look like. Clearly we can see this tree is a lot deeper and also wider. In reality, this is way deeper and way wider. Uh, in our real application. Of course, this tree is much shallower. Uh, this would allow us to coordinate the animations, the transitions a lot easier, right? In this example, for instance, if we tap on the, uh, uh, the shortcuts at the bottom, what if we want to slide out the location editor on top or we want to slide out the, uh, the feed at the bottom? If we you know, follow the exact same deep uh, um, design of business scopes, this will be incredibly hard to do because they'll be jumping multiple levels through multiple objects. But because we can have a view tree that's asymmetric to the business tree, now we can have a shallower tree where everything is just all together. They're all siblings, right? Shortcuts, location editor, map, and so on. They're all siblings. So then, of course, it becomes really easy to coordinate the animation to slide out one out, slide in the other one. So that's what a rib is. Now let's take a look at how that compares with the traditional architecture. I think a lot of people sort of either wanted to ask this question or have already asked this question. Um, so most of this stuff are pretty much the same, which is Viper, MVC, MVVM, they all lock us into this idea of uh, every scope uh, must correlate to a view, right? Um, I think uh, if you are on iOS, you are pretty familiar with, we can create a view controller tree but does it make sense for, for, for all the individual scopes that we design in our application to actually have a view? Probably not. The same goes for the, all, the other, uh, all the other architectures. In fact, um, 
when Thomas mentioned before, we spent six months just toying around and building the architecture itself. We actually tried out all of these things. We first built our application, the core flow, the UberX, Uber trip, uh, Uber pool trips, using this, the, these uh, uh, architectures. And what we realized that was, I think Thomas alluded to that as well, is it was very difficult for us to sort of make sure our business logic is isolated, make sure that our scopes are well-defined, but at the same time still allow the flexibility in performing animations. We really couldn't do that. So that's why we went from this to RIB. So what did we sort of end up with after we rewrote our entire writer application? Um, because our application is, grow so, is, is growing so fast, this, the, all these uh, figures are probably not really accurate. But we roughly have 500 ribs in our application. They each define their scope. They each have a, their own invariant dependencies. A lot of them are reused. Uh, I think in the previous picture, I illustrated that the location editor can be launched both when you're requesting a trip, but also when you're on trip. So we don't have to rebuild that. We can just reuse it. This is, this is a, a, a pretty neat thing, but I, I guess a lot of the ar other architectures can also provide for us. Um, because we've broken down each scope into further smaller units, the routers, the interactors, the builders, the view controllers, and the views, uh, we actually, our classes, our files have become so small. Uh, most of them are 300 lines-ish. Um, and imagine you're working with a code base that every time, single time when you try to modify something, the only thing you need to understand is roughly 300 lines of code. Isn't that great? And because of that, unit testing and UI testing also became a lot easier, right? We're, every time we're unit testing, we're testing a small portion of the code base. Um, and that's why most of our, uh, I would say, all of our business logic is really well tested. So we have high confidence when we change a piece of code, we know that this new, new change we introduced will indeed work and will not break our entire application. So that's pretty much it for the RIB topic. Um, there's even more details that we can go into, of course, as we build more and more uh, 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 ribs and how do we put them together, how do we correlate them and, uh, and so on. Um, as we start open sourcing this stuff, I think it will generate more better and better documentation. Uh, and hopefully by then we can go into even more details than a 20 minute talk can cover.